name of Jesus. Amen. Celebrate the presence of the Lord. Celebrate the goodness Amen. of God this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you. You can have your seat. Oh, thank God for his awesome glory. What a way to put a close to this very wonderful teaching that we've been handling this month of May. Next week we'll be shifting gears to something a bit different. We'll be having the school of worship. And so on Sunday we'll be sharing on the theme. And so for the sake of time, because time is really past. And that's the beauty of being in the presence of the Lord is every time we step into the presence of the Lord, we step into the eternal space, to an eternal space where your time is translated to an eternity, to an eternal experience. And this is what we're experiencing in this place. And I believe you that was watching us, that's the exact same thing that you are experiencing from the presence of the Lord. So I thank God for his presence and I just want to go straight to the word of the Lord. <clears throat> I hope you have your pen and your notebook because we are going to write a lot of things or you have a, a way of writing, a form of writing material because the things we're going to share today, they need an understanding that we'll need also a revisit and thank God this uh, message is available online so you can refer to it you'll be able to pause it and go through it and rewind it because some of the things I'm sharing today are very 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 essential and I just want to celebrate the Lord just allow me for one minute to just thank God for his presence because there's such a weight such a heaviness of the presence of God in this place Father I just thank you I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your glory. I thank you for the expression of yourself that is in this house. Lord, I thank you that we are in that presence where Ezekiel fell. But for necessity, your spirit is causing me to stand. And therefore, I celebrate your presence. I don't take you for granted. But I celebrate you and I thank you. Jehovah, thank you for who you are. Thank you for who you are. And glory be to your holy name now and forevermore. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Wow. Well, God is so heavy in this place this morning. Such a weight of God, such a heaviness of God, a weight of the presence of the Lord. She pakufla bruz nivil haru vikadash taida. Kazikilo ni afradigash nefrul vodu yedipididis naida. Thank you, Holy Ghost. In the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 2. Let me read the first 10 verses for the sake of time. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the Bible says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. However, we speak wisdom 
among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of a man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Verse 10 says, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. And may the Lord bless his word. I want to discuss about this manifold wisdom called salvation. This is what we'll be talking about today. So, Paul says that he did not come. Speaking to the Corinthian church, he tells them, I did not come to you. I did not come with the excellence of speech. The word there, excellency, is huperoki. Huperoke. Spelled H-U-P-E-R-O-C-H-E. Huperoke. And the meaning of that is prominent, superior, or authoritative speech. I did not come with the excellence of speech or wisdom. The Hebrew word there is Sophia, which means either human wisdom or divine wisdom. It says, but it says, I don't come with that, declaring what? Declaring to you the witness, the testimony. That word testimony there is the Hebrew word marturion, spelled M M A R T U R I O N. I'll say that again M A R T U M A R T U. R I O N. M A R T U R I O N. Marturion. Which means something evidential. Something evidential. One of the things that you need to understand about the gospel of Jesus Christ is that every time the authentic gospel of Jesus is decreed, what is called the testimony of Jesus Christ, it is evidential. It's not just a story, it is evidential. And you see this in the book of Luke. I'll just go there very quickly. Luke chapter 7. Some of these ones we will quote them because of time. Luke chapter 7 from verse 18. From verse 18 the Bible says, Then the disciples of John reported to him concerning all these things. And John calling two of his disciples sent them to Jesus saying, Are you the coming one? Or do we look for another? Verse 20. When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you saying, Are you the coming one? Or do we look for another? Verse 21 is where I want us to note. I was saying, at, and at that very hour, he cured, at that very hour, he cured many of infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits. And to many blind, he gave sight. At that very hour, same hour. Jesus answered and said to them, go and tell John the things you have seen and heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Verse 23, and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Now I want us to look at what happens. They come and they ask Jesus, are you the one or should we look for another? And at that hour when they are asking that question, the setting is such that Jesus will produce evidence. So the testimony of Jesus Christ, the message of Jesus Christ is a message that is evidential. That is how it is accredited. That is how it is validated in every generation. It is evidential. In other words, that you will present someone in a case that they were in before the gospel and their state after the gospel and it will be pure evidence. They can show you who they were and who they are. That's how the gospel is. That is what is called the testimony. And that's the reason why you find the enemy in our day is trying to remove the evidence. Because if it is, the evidence is removed from it, then it begins or it remains to be a nice story. But I refuse to talk a story. I refuse to preach a story. See, when I stand here, I am evidence of this God. As I'm standing here, as I'm speaking these things, I'm the evidence of this God. I am valid proof 
that this which I am speaking is valid, that this which I'm speaking is authentic. What proof do I have? My own life. If I begin giving you my testimonies that I should have died in my mother's womb, that I should have perished while I was in my mother's womb. When I came out at the age of three, I had leukemia. And I thank God for my parents, Bishop Peter Silla and Reverend Dorothy Silla, that prayed and kept me by this word, by faith, they kept me alive. I was given a couple of months to live, and I'm still alive today, a couple of years later. And I can go on and on and on and on. Telling you about the evidences, the things that this gospel has produced. So we are not just talking a story. There is a reality about this one. It is called the testimony. It is called the testimony of Jesus Christ. It has proof. It has proof. Maturion. He says, I did not come to you with the eloquence of speech. I did not give you a nice defense about the gospel. Because the sinner does not need for Jesus to win the debate. Uh, Jesus, the, the sinner needs a Jesus that has come to save him. He does not need a Jesus that is a worthy opponent in a debate. That wins it by a margin. No. He needs a Jesus that saves them. That is able to draw them. Because a lot of people have had arguments and others have won arguments and others have lost arguments but their souls were not saved. Their lives were not redeemed. But when the gospel of Jesus is presented to a sinner, it has the power. It is evidential. Uh -uh. It is evidential. And we are going back to the doctrine of evidence. Jesus said, you will become my witnesses. And the apostles say, and we are witnesses of these things. This needs to be the story we have today. The other thing you need to glean from our scripture is that verse 2. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. It says, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ. And him crucified. He says, I determined, I determined not to know anything else among you while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, I have seen something very interesting and I hope that each and every one of you will see it. The reason why you find that proof is being removed from the scripture, proof is being removed from the preaching of the gospel we have now what we call a seeker sensitive approach to the gospel. The reason why that happens is because it allows for people to know extra things apart from Jesus Christ. When there is no evidence, the glory that should belong to Christ is shared among other things. Paul says, because of the evidence I came with, because of what I brought, because of the kind of a message I brought. The only thing I wanted you to tell me is Jesus Christ. The only thing I wanted to increase my knowledge is not your trouble, but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because when I preach Jesus Christ and him crucified, there will be evidence. Because the Bible says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was laid upon him and by his stripes we are healed. That's in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. So when I am preaching Christ, when all what I'm talking about is Christ, then there will be the proof of this Christ, which is what? That there will be healing because he was smitten. There will be deliverance from transgression because he was bruised for transgressions. There will be a cleansing of iniquity because he was wounded for iniquities. In other words, there will be proof if the story remains Jesus Christ, then him crucified is made manifest in every platform. So everyone has wanted to introduce every other thing within the story of Christ. Because when you do that, the powers of the age know, when you do that, you dilute that so that people know more than they ought. They know more than they ought. Uh -uh. They know more than they ought. We are in a generation of people that know more than they ought. Why? Because we have known. We come to the settings of the brethren and we begin knowing things that are extra. Not the power of God. The power of God. 
And he says, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And there's something he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. He said, for his letters, say they, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak, and his words contemptible. So, the one that is delivering that scripture, see, that's now the problem of the preaching of the gospel, is that the person that normally is delivering those words, if you hear the words without seeing the person, the words come out very boldly. If you see the person and you begin seeing, there are things you can criticize within that person. Paul says, when I came to you, I did not demonstrate that word, I was a man of God. I did not look like I'm an emoji. <laughs> when I was there, you could despise me. You could despise me. My packaging was not perfect. My suit was not the latest. The car I was driving was not the best. My packaging was not as good as we would have expected for it to be. Because I was with you in weakness. And this is one of the things that we keep on forgetting. As much as I am the testimony of Jesus Christ as an individual, as a preacher, I speak of the things that I have seen, that I have heard, and that I have handled. But there will also be times that I will speak these very things in my weakness. But that does not make these words weak. See, the preaching of the gospel is not reliant on the preacher. Is reliant on the Christ. It does not rely on the anointing of the preacher. It relies on the anointing of the Christ. Because the preaching of Christ means the anointed one and his anointing. When he is preached, the preacher may not be anointed with an international anointing. But that word will not be limited to the space or the influence of this man. So that even you can be in weakness, yet you will demonstrate power. You can be in weakness, yet you will demonstrate might. See, this is the wisdom of salvation. And that's what you begin finding. When salvation begins to be manifested, people always want to repackage it. This is the case of a soul that has never torn the mouth of a lion and torn the mouth of a bear, telling David how to defeat a Goliath. It's repackaging. Because some of the things that we are beginning to add to the gospel so as to look the part are actually demonstrating us in weakness when we are trying to come out as strong. We have got to come to a place of understanding that. And I want to speak, especially to us ministers of the gospel. You've got to come to a place of understanding that the gospel carries its own anointing. That when you are sent to speak it, you're not the one that causes it to be done. Your obedience only allows you to be a channel as to what God is going to do in a place. It carries its own anointing. Mary is told you will give birth to Jesus. She begins to say, I have never carried a child. I have never known a man. But when she says, I yield myself, the rest of the work is left to the anointing that has commissioned her to, that, to do that work. The anointing is what made her pregnant. The anointing is what sustained the pregnancy. The anointing is what allowed the birth of the pregnancy. That where the child was born was not the concern of Mary. The anointing had already prepared it. So even if the person that is speaking it does not look the part, but they are not supposed to look the part. Our work is to voice it and once it is released in the atmosphere, the Christ himself, he is the anointed one and his own anointing do the work that is supposed to be done. So I was with you in weakness, but that did not make the word weak. I was with you in fear. And when I was speaking it, because one of the things that happens is when you have nothing to bank upon in yourself, then you understand that the gospel causes you that speaks it to tremble. There's an arrogance that you have when you've gained eloquence. There's an arrogance you get in life when you gain eloquence. When you get to a place whereby you are so eloquent in your speech. So what that, that, does that normally do? Stephen tells us in Acts chapter 7. He says Moses was a man that was eloquent in speech in Egypt. In all Egypt, he was a man that was eloquent in speech. 
when he was eloquent in speech, he went and killed an Egyptian and tried to save an Israelite. And the match he could become was a fugitive. That's why you have got to refuse to rely on your own wisdom, to rely on your own power. Because when you are preaching this word, knowing that there is nothing you are adding to it, then you tremble in the handling of it. When I am preaching Jesus, when I am preaching Jesus, knowing that there is nothing I am adding to Jesus, I am not adding that when I am preaching him, even though I am in my strength, but I am in complete weakness, if you are to measure in comparison to what I am speaking. So, in comparison to what I am speaking, even though I am in my greatest, even though I have done my best preparation, but I will be manifested in weakness. And that helps me to handle this word. How? With trembling. I handle it with trembling. I handle the word with fear. I don't become careless. Because there's nothing we add. There's nothing we add to this gospel. There's nothing we add to the Jesus that we preach. He is all in all. The Bible says, and when he put all things under his feet, in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 8, he says, and when he put all things in his feet, the Bible says, he left nothing that was not put under his feet. There is nothing that we can bring to the message of Jesus Christ. He is all in all. So I was with you in weakness, in much fear and trembling. That's why woe unto me if I don't preach this gospel. I know I can motivate you, but woe unto me if all what I do is motivate you and not produce Jesus and not present Jesus. Woe unto me if I can motivate you and yet I cannot preach Jesus. There is nothing wrong with people motivating you, but you need to know that motivation is not the gospel. Why? Because the gospel is not a good story that manifests you with good word. No, the gospel is power. Is power. Is power. When people are transformed by the gospel, it is not because they have gone through proper rehabilitation, but the power that was released by word when it accesses a human being, then it causes another life within that human being. That's why I cannot preach it with arrogance. Even though I can. Even though I have the ability. But I cannot put it. It has got to be handled with trembling. It has got to be handled with fear. Glory to the name of Jesus. I have so many things to say and I'm wondering how I'm going to say all of them in this one service. But I will say them. All of them. We are still on page one. So, verse four. It says, and my speech, and my speech and preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. Enticing words. Now, there's something I've commonly said and I want to repeat it. And a lot of us in our day are being seduced to salvation. Venye sa ngini tunapatia nanga hii njili na kaganika ni mistari. So una chocho wali una chocheka. Una muacha ni okoke. I was left with no breath. We come and we tell you how much Jesus loves you. And we romance you with the love of Jesus Christ. Until you lose yourself and give yourself to Christ. Paul says my gospel was not with enticing words. Because we are not trying to make ourselves popular with the gospel. We are only afforded an opportunity to speak it. See, the things I'm speaking right now, if I wanted fame, I would not be preaching the gospel. If I wanted fame, the gospel is not it. And by the way, I am multi-gifted, so I know other ways where I can get fame. I can become a famous man. 
The gospel is not it. That's why even we are having this thing that we're calling the gospel industry. Why? Because the gospel is not in it. So it has become industrial. Yeah. The gospel has been eh, eh. the gospel has been removed from it. That's why it, it is now what? It is industrial. That's why we can now do it by machination. We can computerize it. We can digitize the gospel. We can make it current and applicable in our time. But the Bible says Jesus Christ the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. So Paul says, I did not come to you with enticing words. I did not lure you. I did not call you to salvation. I did not speak until, by the way, you just ended up saved. Mive nyinisiki anaongea. Wanza yo toni yake. Mive nyinisiki zo maneno anazi bounce. The way his tone was bouncing. You know, he would go high and then he would come low. And then he would go high and come low. And this mesmerized you in such a way that you found yourself saved. No. He says, I came with a demonstration of two things. Their spirit and power. Their spirit. Now, let me explain something. <laughs> See, the devil has been here in the earth for the last 6,000 years. But the last 2,000 have been his trouble. He's been on earth for 6,000. But the last 2,000 years have been his most troublesome years. And things are getting worse for him. Now let me explain to you what I mean. See, after Jesus ascended, after Jesus went up to glory, he did not just leave the story of Jesus Christ trending in Jerusalem and in Israel. And this man died and he rose up. That we cruci- he was crucified. There is something he did. He went up and his spirit came down. <laughs> yeah. He went up. Let me speak slowly. He went up. Went up. And his spirit, his spirit came down. What was the significance of that? His spirit coming down. What is so significant about his spirit coming down? It meant that that witness would remain until eternity. That witness would remain until eternity. So meaning what? That when I preach the gospel, when I preach Jesus Christ, I don't just give evidence of his crucifixion, but I also give evidence of his spirit. Let me say this slowly. I don't just give the evidence of his crucifixion and his resurrection, but I also give evidence that his spirit is ruling in our day. So now you see why they have to twist the gospel. So now you see why we have got to be conned out of preaching it rightly. Because we are giving evidence of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit retains what Jesus did 2,000 years as fresh as he did it 2,000 years. He sustains it. The story does not get old. The news does not get old. The power does not doing. It remains consistent. So what happened that day when Jesus was manifested and when he said it is finished and the curtain curtain of a tabernacle or the curtain of a temple was torn into two. To date whoever believes in this Jesus gets this very experience where Jesus says it is finished in their lives and Jesus also confirms an open way to the Father. So the Spirit, that's what we give evidence of. He says, I gave evidence. I demonstrated the Holy Ghost and I demonstrated the power. I demonstrated the Holy Ghost and I demonstrated the power. Now which power is this? It is the power that is vested in the name. Because the name of Jesus does not just carry authority, but the name of Jesus carries power to execute 
that authority. That's why when you say to someone, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and pick up your bed and walk. There is something about that word that commands the person to stand. But the power in that name gives power, gives strength to that person to stand. Can I say that again? That when I say, pick up your bed and go in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, that name gives you the will to obey. And the power in that name causes you to obey. Gives you the will that you will find yourself standing. But then you are a cripple. How does a cripple stand? How does a cripple stand? But the cripple, because of the name, authority in the name, has commanded him to stand. But power in the name makes him stand. That's what Peter said. He said, it is the name of Jesus and the faith in that name that has made this man to stand upright as you see him. It's that name. So he says, I demonstrated the spirit of God. Because the Holy Spirit, as we see in the book of John chapter 16, is that he was one that convicts the world of sin, of judgment, and of righteousness. That when he is present, when the Holy Spirit descends in a place, and we begin to give the evidence of the Holy Spirit, a sinner that is there will be convicted of sin. <laughs> the demonic powers that have been ruling over people, please hear me clearly. The demonic powers, the demonic authorities that have been ruling over people, are convicted in that space, they are convicted of their judgment. He says, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of, ju of, of judgment. He says, sin, because, uh, or can we read it in John chapter 16? I don't even plan to go that direction. And I have a lot of things to say. Verse 8, he says, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because, of sin because they, they do not believe me. So, because they don't believe in Jesus, whoever has not believed in Jesus as yet, when the Holy Spirit comes, begins to convict that person of who? Of their sin. That's why when Peter is speaking to the, to the multitude that has come to, his, to Jerusalem during the feast, as he is speaking to them, although they have not believed in Jesus, everything that Peter said, the Bible says, and their hearts were pricked conviction for their sins and they asked what must we do to be saved so when the holy spirit is in a place he makes the sinner not be comfortable he makes brings the reality of the sinner's sin to their conscience and begins to convict them and calls them sinner secondly he says of of righteousness because so when when now we are living righteous lives when we're living righteous lives, what are we demonstrating? What are we demonstrating? That Jesus has ascended to the Father and that we see him no more, right? But the common eye shall not see him because he has ascended. So the proof of Christ's ascension is what? Is our righteousness. So that's why we begin to be persuaded. We begin to be convicted about what? About righteousness. Are you not seeing that? Verse 11 says, uh -huh, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. So now this is the most critical point you need to understand. That not only does he convict us of righteousness, that's why everyone that experiences the reality of the Holy Spirit begins to have a desire to walk with God in greater righteousness. How I know that you're not interacting with the Holy Spirit is not because you are not speaking in tongues, but because there is no urgency. There is no craving within your heart for righteousness because it is the proof that Jesus has ascended. If, they, if it is proof that Jesus has ascended, it means that what he did on the earth, because the essence of his ascension means that everything about what we preach about in the gospel is true. It means that he came in the form of a human being. He died for sin and he went up to glory. That's what the ascension does. My goodness. That's what the ascension does. The ascension convicts us that Jesus ascended. 
the righteousness convicts us that Jesus ascended. If he ascended, it means he descended. If he ascended, it means he descended. If he descended, it means he took the form of a man and was found when he was found as a man, he took on the form of a servant and was obedient until death. That proves it. So when people are trying to look for the historical proof of if Jesus died on the cross, the life of Jesus Christ, they don't need to go and look for history. They need to go and find is there righteousness on the earth? Is there someone who is being persuaded within their hearts who is consistently making themselves pure even as he himself is pure that's evidence i'm talking about the manifold wisdom of salvation glory to jesus the manifold wisdom of salvation what has been hidden for ages is now made manifest in our day Here hallelujah and the last thing is what is that the prince of this world is judged. Now, I find this very interesting because every time you begin to demonstrate the Holy Ghost, judgments are passed on every demonic establishment that is around your life or around that area. Judgment is passed. That's why the devil does not want us preaching by the Holy Ghost. That's why the devil wants us to preach according to your situation right now. The situation that Corona has put you in. The devil wants me to talk about that. Doesn't want me to talk about the reality of the Holy Ghost. Doesn't want me to preach the gospel as wisdom. Because it manifests that if I'm preaching by the Holy Ghost, as I'm preaching it, the sinner is being convicted. Of his sin. The righteous man is being convicted of righteousness. And the Satan within that space is being judged. Ay, 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 ay. That's how habits are broken. That's how demonic things are broken. That's how family curses are broken. It's because that prince in that space is judged. So when the Holy Spirit comes to a space like this in Ruiru that I am speaking. That even though he has power. But when he enters here, he enters judgment. That's why demons begin to cry out. That's why demons begin to scream. That's why the Bible says when Philip preached Jesus in Samaria, the Bible says with great shrieks, with great shouts, demons left the people. He did not preach deliverance. He preached Jesus. And every principality in that space was judged. That's why I don't need to preach about demons for me to cast out demons. I can preach about wealth and demons of sickness will live. Why? Because as long as it is not wealth that I'm preaching, it is Jesus that I'm preaching, then Satan in that space must be judged. Hey, glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus Christ. Hey, eh? He says in the book of Romans chapter 15 verse 19. And through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, I have fully preached the gospel. And this is where I want to end up, verse 1 to verse 4. He says, by what? Signs. Mighty signs and wonders that are being facilitated by the power of the Spirit of God. By the power of the Spirit of God. Now, I know there's something we like saying, especially as preachers. We like saying it a lot. But we don't major on the we don't major on miracles. We major on the word. There is no way you can preach the word and it fails to produce the miraculous. What is called full gospel, and thank God there are churches that are called full gospel. I hope they are doing this. What is called the full gospel is one that is preached by mighty signs and wonders that are facilitated by the power. Of the spirit of God. He said I have fully. Preached the gospel. I have fully. Preached the gospel. That's why Jesus would preach. He would teach and tell them blessed. Are the peacemakers. And then he would heal them. It's called full preaching. That's why you cannot hear a word like this. And your life. Recedes back to how it was. There's something about this gospel. It's called manifold wisdom. That's why you will never get, listen, 
You can never replicate what happens with the gospel of Jesus Christ by any magic, by any sorcery, or by any religious belief. You can't get the same results. What the gospel does is exclusively the gospels. What the gospel does is exclusively the gospel. There are miracles that your uncle can do for you. But there are miracles that only the gospel can do. Eh? There are things that your connections can get you, but there are certain things that will only happen by the power of the spirit of God. And that follows the preaching of the gospel. One of the ways to ensure as a believer that God is with you is not by saying I am a friend of God. Is by laying hold of the gospel. The Bible says, and they left with joy in Mark chapter 16. And the apostles left with great joy. And they went and preached Jesus. And the Lord confirmed the word which they preached was with them. The Lord was with them, confirming the word which they preached with signs and wonders. One of the greatest ways to guarantee God to be with you is by which gospel you are handling. Because that one, the gospel of Jesus Christ allows for the spirit of God to be present and he begins to demonstrate. So the gospel is by demonstration. And you can never remove demonstration. I know there are people that are doing theatrics. I'm not talking about theatrics. I'm talking about demonstration. When Jesus was raised, the Bible says he was raised by the glory of the Father. He was raised by the glory of the Father. When that glory descended in that cave, in that tomb, where he was buried, them that were watching over it, they fell down like dead men. I know there are people that can be slain by theatrics. And they fall down and they stand up and nothing has changed. But when it is by the power of God, you will not fail to fall. You will not, these were not believers. They were not filled by the Holy Ghost. But their understanding or lack of was not consequential in their reaction because it is by the Spirit of God. Oh, hallelujah. This should be making you happy. So Paul is saying, this is how we are preaching. This is how we are preaching. We've been preaching it by what? By evidence. We've been healing the sick. That's why a lot of times you just think, oh, what Jesus wants to do is do you good. Because that's what we've been preaching. Because that's the gospel. He says, but there's another dimension. And until you attain it, until you attain it, you will remain in this level and you will get fed up. And let me say something. And a lot of people are saying people are doing fake miracles. But you need to know that we are also doing real miracles. Amen. By the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. It's just that those are the ones you Google. The ones that are doing authentic ones, you don't Google them. But we are there. If you want to check, go to your Google. And Google. And you will see our names there. We are doing miracles. By the spirit of God. Because we are preaching the gospel. So you have been trained to only look for the ones that have scandal. But there are others that have power. Anyway. <laughs> and the gospel will not stop being preached like that. Huh? It will not stop. Even with negative publicity. We will keep on raising the dead. We will keep on praying for those that have corona. And they will get healed of corona. You know, and those that have cancer, and those that are having all kinds of diseases, arthritis is getting healed. If I will tell you how many cases of asthma, arthritis, that I have seen the Lord heal, I've seen the Lord raise people from the dead. These are no stories we talk about. And this demonstration will not stop it because you're emotional about it. <laughs> Because, because you will brand me fake. That's up to you. I will keep on preaching this gospel. <laughs> because there's one thing that you can never change. 
Someone that was sick and now is healed, you cannot persuade them about the process of their healing. The man that was blind from his youth, the Pharisees are telling him this man is a sinner. And he's casting them out by Beelzebub. And all these kinds of things. Give glory to God. He was just a vessel. Isn't that what they are saying in John chapter 9? I'm, I'm bringing it to the lingo of our day. Eh? Yo ni kiburi. He, he cannot be a servant of God. How can he be a servant of God? How can he be a servant of God? Anezaje kuwa yeni mtumishi wa mungu. Kaba ni mtumishi wa mungu angepatia mungu utukufu. Give glory to God. But he says, I don't know. Whether he's a good man, Dioe. Whether he's a bad one, Ndese. <laughs> oh, what I know is that I was blind and now I can see. But about your theological argument. So we will keep on doing that to the world. Now, let me announce it. We will keep on doing that to the world. People will keep on experiencing miracles. We may not be laying our hands on you right now, but we are speaking and the same word that would happen, the same thing that would happen if I laid my hands on you is happening now even as I'm speaking to you. And we are not going to stop it because people are emotional about it. Lakini tunalena ikitu. Hii sasa ni shallow waters. Sasa tuanze kuingia. Now we are measuring a thousand cubits. That was his, and the angel measured a thousand cubits. So watch and a thousand cubits. So Paul is saying, this is not the only thing we can talk about. He says, we are talking about it because it's the only thing you can handle. And because your theology is yet to be, to be aligned in this regard, there is something that you are kept away from. Sinimesema na wapimia? Eh? It's not the only thing we can do. It's just because the level that we are in has necessitated for us to stay there. He says, how, how bait we speak a wisdom? How bait we speak a wisdom? What does the Bible say? Sasa tumeanza kuingia. Hey. Mungu wa wapatia neema. I'm in Romans. First Corinthians chapter 2. He says, verse 6, he says, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. Some translations, I believe the King James Version says, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Perfect. How be it we speak a wisdom among them that are mature or perfect? Yet not the wisdom of this age nor of the rulers of this age. Who are coming to nothing. Sasa hapa. Hapa ndo shide na kuchanga inaanza kwa ingililia. This is where trouble, trouble begins. But there's something he said in verse 5, before we get to verse 6. <laughs> something he said in verse 5. He said that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And I made a statement and said, I'd rather not be quoted because of a wise thing that I spoke, but that someone becomes the evidence of the speech released. It's not man's wisdom, but the power of God. I would rather you don't say that's deep, but that your life is translated by what I've said. We are having a lot of people that are saying that's deep. Steve Harvey, some a couple of years ago. I don't know with the a lot with the many rules and laws. I don't know if I should have mentioned his name. Let me call him a famous actor, <laughs> famous comedian. Did a show a couple of years and it was called That's Deep. So that's deep, that's deep. So we have a lot of things that make people say that's deep. But we look for the power. I don't want you to say what I'm saying is deep. Let your life be translated. Let there be a translation of your existence. Let there be a translation of your experiences with God. Let there be a translation of the things that you encounter with God. So verse 6 he says, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. 
So you have got to understand two things about wisdom. That wisdom wisdom is a dialect. Wisdom is a lingo. Wisdom is a language. And wisdom is a discourse. Wisdom is a language. And wisdom is a discourse. So when we say we speak wisdom among them that are mature. See, my tribe is Kenyan. I'm, I'm Kenyan. My tribe in Kenya is Amukamba. Alright? Now, those that are of the Bantu origins, I can understand what they say. You know? That when I as a Kamba, I say Kea. Akihui will say Kerea. So we kind of understand what exactly is happening. But I may not understand those that are Nilotic and those that are Kushites. I will a lot of times hear what they are speaking as gibberish. Like for example, I have been trying to understand what people say in Luo and I still don't get it. But you know, there's something about that language that makes the ones that speak it just begin speaking English. And you know, I love English. <laughs> so there's a mystery within the Luo language that carries the element. When you begin speaking it, you will begin speaking Has anyone noticed that? Can you imagine if Apostle William was low? <laughs> we would be having coming to service and we are having dictionaries and giving word interpretation. Hmm? There's something about it that motivates English, right? So now how wisdom is is that it's a language by itself. And then it's also a communique. It's a discourse. It's an interaction. So that those that speak wisdom, the language of wisdom, speak wisdom. Let me say that again. Those that speak the language of wisdom, they speak wisdom. Now, this wisdom is in levels. There is the wisdom of this world. There is the wisdom of the age. There is the wisdom of the world. There is the wisdom of the age. But then there is the wisdom of the perfected. These are levels. There is the wisdom of the world. So there are things that for as old as the earth has been, there are things that have not changed. It's called the wisdom of the world. Yeah, The way we know, for example, if you go to a tall building and you jump, there is a thing called gravity. Gravity did not, was not invented in the 21st century. It's not, you know, synonymous. <laughs> of course, we've known it more because now we had phones. And gravity has really taken its toll. <laughs> yeah? Anyone that has a mobile phone knows. But there's something called gravity. I cannot show you mine because gravity has demonstrated several parts of its authority. Yeah? That's the age. That's the wisdom of the, of the world. There's a wisdom of the age. What makes you feel current? <laughs> I was looking at some of the photos. My photos growing up. And the things that we used to trend in our day and the clothes that used to trend and the makeup that used to trend. You know, right now everybody's wearing things that are tight. You know, when I was growing up we were wearing things that were, you would literally just go sweeping. We used to call ourselves council workers. Because <laughs> you would be walking and you're cleaning the city. We used to wear big things. The amount of material we wasted. I remember one specific jeans trouser that I had. That it was it used to, I don't know if you know those ones, jeans that go like this. It used to go like this. So I wasted material for several other people that should have been clothed. I 
And right now, if you add plus the torn jeans, you find we've really wasted material. We were making complete jeans. Now people are wearing them torn. So you see all that material. But at that time, we were, we were it. Eh? In the fashion. So it's the wisdom of an age. And that's why every age has its own wisdom. And every age thinks the preceding or the succeeding age is an idiotic age. They think that their only discourses are in idiosyncrasy. So, ni idiot tu. Siku zetu. In our days. In our days. I mean, this is the good old. Everybody talks about that. But when they're talking to the age that is before them, they say, you people are old. <laughs> you were. The age before them, they are old. You people are out of touch with reality. But the ones that are following them, you people do not know. Real music. You don't know real fashion. It's the wisdom of ages. And every ruler of an age carries that wisdom. Every ruler of an age carries that wisdom. Now, let me explain something here. I know I'm taking time, but uh, where else are we going? <laughs> where? <laughs> so you've got to understand this, that Satan has taken dominion, has assumed dominion or usurped dominion, over the world so that his wisdom now has become, has gotten to that worldly space that he understands uh, world or earth technology, heaven technology, earth technology, you know, how we, how to manipulate systems, you know, all these things about uh, gene mutation, they are not, they do not begin now. It always was, it always is, always shall be. All these kinds of things. So Satan is the ruler of that world and he carries that world wisdom, right? Now what he does in every age, he gives people that submit themselves to him a measure of that world wisdom and that measure is what becomes age wisdom. That measure is what becomes age wisdom. And because they contain that, they carry that age wisdom, then they end up doing what? Ruling an age. They govern an age. Right? They govern an age. So that's why you'll come and find, for example, the person that was called the king of pop many years ago that everybody was talking about. We have said we're not mentioning names. <laughs> Because some names are not carried by fair use. Anyway. <laughs> so. <laughs> anyway. So. The one that was the king of pop. A couple of years ago. Is not relevant today. They call him the greatest. Then. Or goat. And by then never be called a goat. <laughs> Does not matter. What it means. <laughs> it still means good. Anyway. <laughs> still a what? A goat. So refuse to be placed on the left hand. He says to the goats that are on the left hand. In Jesus mighty name. So. So he ruled the music scene then. He cannot rule it now because now his age passed. He passed signifying the end of an age. Please understand that. When he passed, he signified the end of an age. So that age passed and somebody else rose signifying the beginning of an age. So when they will also now rescind to oblivion, that will also mark the end of the age and that will continue on and on. And on. And this is what Paul is talking about. He says that it is the wisdom of, of the rulers of this age. And he says, what are they coming to? They are coming to nothing. They are coming to nothing. They are coming to nothing. So we are having the wisdom of the world, right? We are having the wisdom of the age. Yeah? That's why people know right now what you ought to do. Like right now, the age we are in, what is trending is corona, right? 
So right now it is sanitized. Eh? Keep a distance. No tells. And wear a mask, right? So like mine is around. In case those of you are wondering where my mask is. <laughs> so right now we are what that what is trending is COVID-19. Since you know in Nandiwa, eh? Statistics of and right now what is what last what was trending in 2019. But in the form yeah, 2020. So now this age is having rulers, is having people that are made prominent and others that are rendered useless or redundant within that system. Now, that is how ages operate. And they operate like that within our world system. This world system is what Nebuchadnezzar was shown as the image where there's a head of gold, a chest of silver, you know, a waist of brass and feet of iron and toes of iron mixed with clay. So that represents the world system which is governed by who? By satanic by Satan and satanic worship, which is the worship of self. That's where it began, head of gold. Am I going into very deep things? No, I said we heal you, but we can speak deep. We don't just pray for your needs. That's part of it. But there's a space called the space of the mature. Here we are. Jesus is Lord. So, it says we speak the wisdom of God. And how is this wisdom of God spoken? Verse 7. It's spoken how? In a mystery. In other words, there is no day the wisdom of God, the wisdom of God will ever be manifested in such a way that it will be plain. What salvation does is that salvation grants you access to enter into unfolded mystery. Now listen, it does not matter how much we simplify the wisdom of God, it still will remain a mystery. It does not matter how well we document it, how well we explain it and expound it and amplify it, it can never be understood because every time the wisdom of God is released, it is released in a mystery. Every time it is released, its official packaging is mystery. So when we speak it, whoever is not supposed to hear it does not need to close their ears. Whoever does not need to hear it does not need to be removed from the place. When it is spoken, they cannot enter into the spaces of mystery where they get to understand it. And so that's why you find the scripture in the book of Isaiah chapter 53 where we quoted earlier on talks about the death of Jesus Christ. Talks about the death of Jesus. Say that Jesus died, that he would die, that he would be wounded for transgressions. But because the word was there, the prophetic book was there, all of the law and the prophets were there. From the time which Isaiah spoke this, some people estimate it to be 1500 years, others 800 years, right? But from the time when Isaiah spoke this word to the time it was manifested, this word was clearly documented. Isaiah 53 never changed. But Satan and his cohorts could not understand it. Because it is spoken in a mystery. The birth of Jesus was not a secret. It was a mystery. Let me say that again. The birth of Jesus was not a secret. Sio ile alikuja akambia Michael the prophet akamwambia na usiambie mtu. Check check what and show na usiambie mtu. No that's not how it was. It was not a secret. It was a mystery. So it was in plain sight. But those that were plain could not see it. I'll say that again. It was in plain sight. But those that were plain. Those that were simple. Could not understand it. So they saw it. And when they saw it. They burned it. Others tore it. Others threw it. But they just did not know what it meant. That's why even when I'm preaching this gospel, there are people that are hearing different kinds of things. Some people are wondering, when will this man get to the point? Others are already in the point. <laughs> Yo. 
Others are already understanding what God is saying. Others are waiting for me to bring the conclusion of the message. Because a good message must have an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. So some people are waiting for it. But others are already in the mystery. Is this thing not exciting? It says, if it is ordained, it was ordained before the ages, and it is ordained for what? For our glory. Meaning that when you get to understand this wisdom, there is no way you can be ashamed. Let, let me tell you. I have experienced all kinds of warfare in my journey with the Lord for the last 28 years of my salvation. I have experienced all kinds of fights. I have experienced the devil doing everything that he can do. But I realize that there is something he can never touch. It's called my glory. Why? Because what has guaranteed my glory is my understanding of the mystery. The wisdom of God is what exempts me from shame. It's not that the devil does, hasn't been doing things to shame me. He has done. In fact, some people know the shameful things that the devil did. It's just that they are wondering why I'm not ashamed. It's not because I'm good at cover up. But there is mystery that has delivered me from the hand of my enemy. Some people, I'm telling you, there's people who knew me. That when they see me preaching, they're wondering, how is this man preaching? Because some of them, I told them, I'll never preach. But wisdom happened. Hey, wisdom happened. Some people, life is happening. Me, wisdom is happening. Some people are experiencing life. But me, wisdom is happening daily. Because these things were ordained for my glory. So, while people are saying, whoever prophesied good in 2020 is a liar and you should be stoned. You, you remain there. Some of us are having a good year. Some of us are enjoying 2020. Why? Because it cannot manifest shame to us. There are things we understand that when I should have been ashamed, I, mystery was unveiled. Let me say that again. That when I should have been ashamed, mystery was unveiled. Hey. They are meant for my glory. And he says, verse 8, which none of the rulers of this age knew. This age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, there are people, let, let me tell you, there are people right now that know how and what you need to invest in because it's the wisdom of the age. But there are things that they are doing. And how you get to know, listen to me, listen to me very clearly, how you get to know that someone does not understand the wisdom of God is that they always seek to crucify it. <laughs> how you know Someone does not understand. Because in our day, the greatest mystery of God that is unveiled is not just the scripture, it's the church. Because the word is committed to the church. So now when you begin finding people bullying the church, it's not because they are stronger, it's just because they are fools when it comes to the wisdom of God. What they are doing is foolish. Why? Because they should know. As the high priest Kaifa said, he said that if this is of God, we cannot stop it. He said, and let us take care lest we be found fighting with God. But you know, for them, they don't see themselves fighting with God because the Bible says in the book of Psalms, chapter 14, verse 1, it says, The fool saith in his heart, There is no God. So if there is no God, I cannot be fighting God. The God that these Christians are talking about. Oh, 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 oh he, he. No, it's nothing. It's not that we are not understanding. It's that you have no insight to the wisdom of God. Because had you known, had you known, Jesus, had they known, Jesus would be alive now, <laughs> waiting for a ge foolish generation that will not know that wisdom to crucify him. And this is what must keep on being spoken to the mature. To the perfect. So this one is not for beginners. It's for the perfect. And let me just make some closing remarks I'm realizing here. Tuko page one, two, two God. And you know what you mean. 
Let's go to Second Timothy. This is where I'm going to conclude. When God allows me next, we'll continue from there. Second Timothy chapter 3. I want us to look at a few things and then we pray. So the reason why you find you being attacked is because somebody does not understand the wisdom of God. Otherwise, whoever knows the wisdom of God would never touch you. Would never touch you. One of the things that I've come to realize is when God wants to finish something, he allows it to touch you. <laughs> because the most foolish thing anything can do anyone can do, any principality, power, ruler, or authority can do, is touch you. Is touch you. They were trying to kill a sect, a Jewish sect, by killing its principal leader. 2,000 years ago, it is the dominating religion on the earth. You can say, well, some people are not preaching this Jesus, but it's Jesus they are talking about. In whichever way, whichever form. They tried to silence it in Jerusalem. Now a man in Ruiru is speaking this thing. A whole Mukamba me is here in Ruiru saying these things. I am not of the tribe of Benjamin or Ata to Kijaribu Kufanyele Nitoganini genealogy ile website ya kucheck genealogy eh tracing your genealogy hakuna zvenye nitafika mkute mkute ati mimi by the way i'm a levite yeah by the way but somebody made a foolish move in touching one they should not have touched eh let me say to us kenyans I know we normally like quoting this scripture, touch not the anointed, and saying, oh, that scripture is being misused. Do this, don't touch them. Because once you touch them, it's a foolish move. When you touch the Lord's anointed, you give the Lord an opportunity to deal with you. When you leave the Lord's anointed, you give an opportunity to God to deal with his anointed. Lakini, whatever says your vote. Go somewhere, you're not going to go somewhere. Ata mimi uneza ongea jiyango. Hallelujah. Any point. Second Timothy chapter 3. I want to share a few things here and then we, we pray. From verse 14 it says, but you must continue in the things you have learned and be assured, being assured of, knowing from whom you've learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. May the Lord bless his word. Now these are the things you need to understand about the word. Because what matures a person to perfection is the word. Now why you don't find somebody understanding the wisdom of God is that they have not been perfected by the mystery and the ministry of of the word of God. Because the word of God is expressed in several things, in several ways, or it does some very critical things. There are certain things that the word of God does, and you need to understand them. Number one, the word manifests a person from whom you will know and remember that you heard it from them. The word, listen, I know a lot of people say, I want to pursue God and I don't want to meet a man. I don't need a man to know God. No. The word, the authentic word of God will always produce a person that will speak it to you. Let me say that slowly. The word will always produce a person. It will always produce somebody. For the last 28 years of my salvation, I have been under a man called Bishop Peter Sila for the last 28 years. Bishop Peter Sila is my biological father. But Bishop Peter Sila is also my spiritual father. I could read the Bible 
But for me to understand the God of the Bible, he had to speak him to me. Using the same scripture that I can read, when he spoke that scripture, he introduced me to the God that I know. Never be cheated by that scripture will just be self-discovery. It can never be because it is a mystery. The word of God is a mystery. You don't just discover it. There are things in this word that unless I, by the grace that God has given me, unless I speak them to you, you will never know them. But you will read the same scriptures. You just won't know what they are saying. That's why you have got to value the people that speak it to you. Because they are not availed by opportunity. They are availed by the word. There are people in this life that will never hear Mikasila. There are people that even with our content online, they will never have access to it even one day. Why? Because the word they know has not yet availed me to them. That's why those that are hearing me now, those that respond to my ministry, is because the word you know, the place where you got in your work with God, necessitated for me to be manifested. That's why you've got to know, not just the word that you've had, but who you had it from. This is not this is not baby talk. This is not this is not baby talk, my friend. This is maturity. You begin to understand maturity when you stop despising people that God is using to speak to you. If you don't value the person that has spoken, you don't value the word spoken. Even if you go and read it by yourself and get your own revelation, God knows you won't work it. Because word that becomes beneficial. Word that you get to see glory from is a word that becomes flesh. It's a word that is tangible. It's a word that someone is able to instruct you in. Fleshy word is the word that changes your life. And that one will come through a man. So what have I done consistently? For the last 28 years, I, this I have done consistently. I have many people that I can listen to. I, have, I know many good preachers, but I only listen to the people that my father has endorsed. To date, listen to me, to date, no one has ever, ever laid their hands on me, at least willingly. No, no one has ever laid their hands. I have never taken my head to date, I have never taken my head to someone to lay their hands on me that my father has not endorsed. And I can count to you the number of people that have laid their hands on me. The hands that have been laid consistently on this head are Bishop Peter Silla's hands. And that will never change. And because he is alive for a long time, believe me, he on your phone. So when you hear me preaching righteousness, you hear me preaching holiness, this did not just come because I read the scripture, but someone spoke it, spoke righteousness into me, spoke holiness into me. Have you ever realized that what you see in scripture is determined by who spoke it? That's why you can look from Genesis to Revelation. I began researching the scripture and I would read from Genesis to Revelation and see all oh, what's talking about is holiness, righteousness, the fear of God, serving God, the Holy Ghost. I saw the Holy Ghost in Genesis chapter 1. I saw him in Revelation chapter 22. That is all because that's what the man that spoke to me, the word has been speaking. Right? That's why Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, the things you have learned from me. The things you have learned of me, the things that you've learned from me. Now, let me conclude that statement by quoting Ephesians chapter 4 verse 8 to 16. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 8 to verse 16. Ephesians 4 verse 8 to 16. Where the Bible says that he that descended is the same one that ascended. It says and when he ascended he gave gifts to men which are called the gifts of his ascension. 
when he ascended, he gave gifts to men. He says, and he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, to be evangelists, pastors, teachers, and what have I left? Evangelists, right? Have I said evangelists? He said, what are they for? For the equipping of the saints for works of ministry. Listen. Eh? For? For the edification of the body, right? For the edifying of the body. And what else? Verse 13. Till we all come to what? To the unity of the faith. To our? To the knowledge of their Son of God, we come to the unit of the faith, have single faith. We ha come to the knowledge of the Son of God. And lastly, unto a perfect man. So a perfect man is one that has one faith and, and perfected knowledge of the Son of God. Now, this will not come by you reading the scripture and going to a prayer mountain. It will come by you receiving a gift that he has released as a sign of his ascension. This will not, I tell you, this will not come because you know how to seek God. Go seek God for yourself. I know we like saying that. Go seek God for yourself. Now, nah, there are things you will not know about God. There is a faith you will never be united in. And that's the plague of the 21st century. And let me tell you what this is. Let me speak it plainly. Those that want to argue, that's up, up to you. Let me speak it plainly. It is a new age doctrine. It is new age doctrine that decides that you can define God for yourself. It is new age doctrine that decides that you can define God. God for yourself. God is not God because of the way you perceive him. God is God because of who he is. And he has a pattern of flow that ensures that if you follow it, you will know him as he really is. As he really is. Some of you are despising pastors that have raised you. Hey, I'm speaking to you, Christian. You are despising a pastor that's raised you. Because now you have gotten revelation. If that person never spoke it the first time, you had no access to any revelation. Hiya. Hiya. You have no access to any revelation. Glory to the name of Jesus. Are you understanding this? And we have to read the story of Acts, Acts chapter 8, from verse 26 to verse 39, where, where Philip is instructed by the Holy Ghost. He has gone to Samaria, and Samaria by the Holy Ghost has gotten to be born again. By the Holy Ghost has gotten to be born again. But then, now he is sent to another one, that is an Ethiopian eunuch. An Ethiopian eunuch, that is coming from Jerusalem, because they are Judaic. Even though they are Ethiopian, but they are Judaic. They follow Judaism. Now, he comes from worship. He has come from worship in Jerusalem. He is opening the scripture and reading the book of Isaiah chapter 53. And he is reading it loudly because Philip heard him reading it. And when he read it, he did not understand it. Because you've got to understand what? The word that grows you is not for private interpretation. It's not what that word is saying to you. It's not what the word means to you. It's what is the word saying that unites you in the place of faith. Because the one thing the word keeps on doing consistently is increasing the measures of your faith. The word does not make you comfortable in your situation. The word grows you from your situation, bringing you to perfection. Unity of faith and the knowledge of Jesus Christ that you come to a place where you attain a perfect man. Unto a perfect man. What does the scripture say next? A perfect man. I don't know why you do not have a microphone today.
You're in Ephesians 4 verse 13. Because the things that I want us to say there. It says, unto the measure of the stature of what? Of the fullness of Christ. So, the word of God is not bringing you to live a good life. To be the best you. No. The word of God is not making you the best you. The word of God is conforming you to the full measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In other words, you've got to understand that. The full measure, complete, what it is that makes Christ the Christ. His totality, his completeness. And that is being released by the fivefold ministry. You despising the fivefold ministry, you despising people that are sent to you, will ensure you only become a better you. You will never attain the perfection of Christ. So if you are an arrogant you, you will become very better in arrogance. If you are a foolish you, you become very, very good at folly by the word. Because you refuse an instructor. Number one. Is that not a good thing? And that's why this word has got to be delivered from men. That's what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 2. And let me, let me quote something that uh, Philip did in verse 35 of Acts chapter 8, verse 35. The Bible says, and listen to this. The Bible says, and Philip opened his mouth and began speaking from that point. So, so, <laughs> from that point. So, the point where this man had read the scripture, what he had understood up until that point, Peter began from there, Philip began from there, and began preaching Jesus from there. Wacha ni kwambie, neema ambayo tumepatiwa, ni kwa sababu tunezo ubiri, yes, we can preach Jesus Christ from the story of do not murder. We can present Jesus from that point. That's why those of you that think preaching is just taking the Bible and reading a scripture and expounding it, eh? You can expound it morally, but presenting Jesus is an anointing that you qualify for. And Philip could not have met that man until he was trusted as a deacon and trusted also by the apostleship to lead others to salvation. He was quantified by the apostolic when they came and laid hands on the people that were in Samaria. They commissioned his ministry. So now he was able to speak Jesus from that point. He indoctrinated this man such that when the man had it, he knew what he ought to do and change his life. And I pray that God is going to help us to do this because this is why we are having a lot of arguments. But the Holy Spirit is going to produce for you a person that will instruct you rightly. The second thing is that the word manifests your infancy. Infancy. And you grow from there into wisdom to its perfect level. The word manifests your infancy. It manifests your infancy. And you grow from there. And today, in our day, we are having too many people that are becoming scholars of the word when they ought to be babes that are growing. You have people that have become scholars, Bible scholars, they are researching when they ought to be what? Babes that are growing. So the word of God is supposed to be manifesting your infancy. That there's a lot you still don't know. But there's a lot that is being put into you at that instant. And this is what you see with, with the Pharisees where Jesus tells them in John chapter 5, I believe it's verse 19. He says, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life, right? He says, but it is the same scriptures that are talking about me. You search the scriptures. So everyone is thinking that there's a way you can have a life from what is being presented. Because in them you think you will have life. That I don't have to go through this man to have eternal life. I can read the Bible from myself. Isn't that what we believe? He says, these are the ones that, these things you think, by them you shall have eternal life. 
He says, but the same scriptures that you're looking for life are the ones that are speaking about me. So instead of these people being manifested as babes, reading the word and manifesting them as babes, it manifested them as scholars, Pharisees, people that are vast in the law and they could not come to the knowledge of Christ. So the one that had come to seek them and the one that had come to save them, instead of them receiving him, they repelled him by the same word that spoke about him. So give yourself to grow. You don't know everything. The Bible says we know in part and we prophesy in part. So what it is that you think is a valid argument is just a part. It's just a part. What you think is a valid argument, why you do not need to be giving your tithes and your offerings is just a part. What is a valid argument as to why you think we should not be speaking in other tongues is just a part. You don't know the whole thing. So instead of you trying there to be a great person, Instead of you trying to be arrogant and demonstrating arrogance, give yourself to the milk of the word. And this is now the thing about the word in the book of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 to verse 3. It says, for laying and laying aside and laying aside these, and it manifests the things you need to lay aside, which is what? Which is all, it talks about all, all what? Malice. The translation there is badness, evil. Naughtiness. Lay aside naughtiness. Lay, lay aside all guile or subtlety. Yeah? In a subtle way, in a cunning way to validate a point that you know. Yeah? <laughs> Have you ever known? And by the way, never fall for that trap. When someone begins telling you to talk about something, never talk about it. They don't want to know it. They want you to give an argument to their affirmative. And uh, no way. It's a sat subtlety. That's guile. Hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. Putting those ones aside. Child of God, put those ones aside. And verse 2 says what? As newborn babes. So when these things are put aside, what do they manifest you as? As a newborn babe. When you put these things aside, you are manifested as a newborn babe. And how does that manifestation of a newborn babe look like? You begin to crave for the milk of the word. See, a baby does not go and read the nutritional facts of milk before they drink it. Eh? You have never heard a baby saying, I, I, prefer, I prefer breast milk and not formula milk. We are the ones that when we begin drinking milk, we, we look, is it soya milk? Eh? Because now we are what? We are scholars. We look, is it soya milk? Eh? I am lactose intolerant. Eh? Have you realized there's nobody that is born lactose intolerant? <laughs> yeah. My friend, put off some things, you will be manifested as a newborn. The word will begin to be sweet to your taste. Verse 3 says, if at all you have tasted that the Lord is good. <laughs> yeah. hmm? Have you ever heard a baby saying that? Mama ulikula ulikula kitungu sumu nyingi zana. Iko na ka taste. Have you ever heard baby saying that? No, they drink it. They take it whole as it is. When they are mature, now they will begin choosing which one they want. Either they want broke side, yeah? Or they want it flavored, which the mother now cannot give. <laughs> anyway, they will now choose for themselves, but up until they are 10. <laughs> but up until then, they grow. So that milk grows them. It grows them. It ensures that their immunity is boosted. It ensures that everything about their life is increasing. Right? The third thing you need to understand, because this one you're seeing it in First Timothy, First Timothy chapter 3. Is it First Timothy or Second Timothy? Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. So we are moving from verse 14, verse 15, verse 16, verse 17. Verse 14, verse 15, verse 16, and verse 17. I hope you're still following. The third thing you need to understand is the Bible talks about all 
scripture. All scripture. Now, God does not speak with one scripture. The voice of God is echoed through all scripture. And that's why if what you believe about God is only supported by one scripture, not by all scripture, it is a falsity. It's a falsity. That's why it is not the word. You don't read the word that speaks to you. You don't read the word <laughs> that helps you in lonely days. The word that works in your life is the whole word. That's why if one a person breaks a part of it, he has broken all of it. And this is not just echoed in the Old Testament. It is also said in the New Testament, James chapter 2 verse 10 and Matthew chapter 19 verse 20 and this uh, chapter 5 verse 19 and 20 and the Bible says, Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 19 verse 20, he says, whoever breaks the law and teaches men to do it. So for you to break the law and to teach men, it means you are having a point of reference that the law that you are breaking is being supported by the law you should not break. So you take the same Bible and justify your breaking of the law because you don't just break it, but you're also teaching men to break it. You should see how people quote scriptures, long passages of scriptures, trying to justify an erroneous position. If it is error, it is still error. One of the parts, two things that I have found that are very, very controversial, that are very controversial in the body of Christ. The second coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ and the laws of giving. And the people who quote scripture, and just because you quote and quote and quote and also quote several other scholars, does not make your premise right. Because it is not one scripture that you read. It is all scripture. And it is not how it is communicated to you. It is how it ought to be. What you remember when I the young girl die. The third thing, I mean, number what? Number four. The third thing is that all scripture is given by inspiration. Inspiration. In other words, that word there, the Greek word is theo news. Huh? <laughs> theo news tells. I pronounce it. You know, I practice them at night. <laughs> Theopneustos. <laughs> Maybe you don't just wake up in the morning and begin speaking Greek. Theopneustos, which means divinely breathed in. So, this Theopneustos, the word comes from neo, pneo or neo, which means to breathe hard or to blow. So, this is how the word is received. The word is breathed by God but it is breathed in by men. So God exhales and man inhales. So what that proceeds, that's why when I'm speaking it, I am under an anointing. I am under an action of the Holy Ghost. That's why the things I'm speaking, they are not encouraging you. They are causing change. Why? Because the spirit that is upon me allowing me to speak is the same spirit that is upon you allowing you to understand. No one can ever understand the reality of the scripture except by the Holy Ghost. And that's why when we begin to demean the ministry of the Holy Ghost, then we remove the understanding of God and his word in the church. So all what we're left with is ritual. Let me tell you, you can read the Bible, but you will never preach the word without the Holy Ghost. You can read the Bible. You can talk the Bible. You can hug the Bible, but you can never receive the word except by the Holy Ghost. And that's why there is that flow. That there must be someone that breathes it out. That's what I'm doing as I'm preaching right now. As I'm proclaiming it, I am shouting it, I am breathing it. I am breathing the word. As I'm doing that, you are receiving it because you are under the same anointing. And that's why I'm believing the Lord to bring us back to the place of congregation. 
Because when we congregate, we come to that place where we are all under one spirit. And that one spirit allows breath and that one spirit allows reception. So when the Holy Spirit breathed, man became. When the Holy Ghost breathed, man became. That's what normally happens. So all word is breathed. That's why I have not just talked about one scripture. Although I can also use one verse. And if it is breathed by the Holy Ghost, it will still bring everything. But remember, it must be all scripture. And all scripture must be all of it breathed. Yeah? The, see, we don't read the word to begin an educative point. It must remain breath. When it is breath, it means it is void of human opinion, human conviction, human experience. The last, number five, is that it is profitable. Profitable. Is profitable. So this pneumatic word is the profit factor of men. The pneumatic word. In other words, the word that is breathed, the word that contains the air, the breath of the Holy Ghost, is the one that is a profit factor of men. That's what the Lord says in the book of Isaiah chapter 14, verse 17. He says, I am the Lord that teacheth thee how to profit. So, and which way you ought to go. Teaches you how to profit. So how does he teach me? By allowing me to hear all word that is being breathed. Word that has breath. Word that has breath. That's why even when you're doing your personal study, Bible study, learn to take more time to invite the Holy Ghost. Invite the Holy Spirit because he's the only one that can breathe it. If you read it, it is just logos. And the logos will give you enticement. Logos will give you enticement because it will give you excellence. Gives you enticement. But the Holy Ghost brings out the power in the word. So it becomes profitable. And it is profitable to do what? When a person or where the, this word is, there is increase in doctrine, which is sequential instruction. In other words, when you begin to be instructed, you continue on to being instructed. In other words, your instruction does not cease. So it is profitable for instruction. It is Profitable for reproof. In other words, it's profitable for conviction and convincing. That, that when you are persuaded about a particular truth, the Holy Ghost will keep on illuminating those scriptures that give you undeniable proof of what it is that you believe about him. If you believe in the righteousness of God, God will keep on highlighting those scriptures, keep on breathing upon them. So you add, you increase because profitability is what? Is increase is increase. So you keep on increasing in convictions. Your convictions, your persuasions. And one of the things that I've come to realize is that even as I'm growing older, my, my convictions, my persuasions about the Holy Ghost, about Jesus Christ and about the Father are continuing to be solidified. They're continuing to increase. Why? Because the word is solidifying them. And the word is profitable for that. And the third thing is that it corrects error. That's why the quickest way to correct error is by the word. And it gives the instruction in righteousness. When these things enter your life, they come in increasing measure. They come in increasing measure. And it is this kind of word that the path that perfects the man of God. This kind of word is what perfects the man of God. Who is the man of God? The man of God is the one that is the Lord's. The man of God is not just the anointed man or a preacher like me. No, the man of God is the one that is the Lord's and that can go for God. The man of God is a person that is the Lord's and can go for God. So when now we are manifested in that context... That's now when we begin to speak wisdom. A wisdom that is not of this world. And I must conclude with this one scripture. In Proverbs chapter 24, how many conclusions have I made? Four. This is number four or number five? Number six. Okay. Proverbs chapter 24 verse 1 to 7. 
Let me read this quickly. It says, do not be envious of evil men, nor desire to be with them. For their heart devices violence. And their lips talk of troublemaking. Through wisdom, a house is built. And by understanding, it is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled. With all precious and pleasant things. A wise man, verse 5. A wise man is strong. Yes, a man of knowledge increases strength. Verse 6, for by wise counsel, you will wage war, your own war, and in a multitude of counselors. There is safety. Verse 7, wisdom is too lofty for a fool. He does not open his mouth in the gate. That now several things that happen with the perfect man that you need to understand. One, he is told, do not envy. Do not envy the wicked. Because the wisdom that is in you, what does it do? It builds a house. <laughs> the wisdom that you carry allows for you to have a building. Allows for a build. Allows for you to have something that is institutionalized. That is an institution. That is a landmark that you can't be ignored. A wise man by wisdom, a house is built. Understanding, it is established. Wisdom builds it. Understanding establishes it. And knowledge fills it. So Jesus says this. He says, the man in Matthew, Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to verse 29, he says, the man that hears my words and does them, he says, I will liken them to a wise man who built his house upon a rock. <laughs> Why? Because what does wisdom do? Wisdom builds. Wisdom builds. See, that's why when Peter got to understand who Jesus was, his understanding, his revelation of the Christ, what did Jesus say? He said, I will build my house. You are Peter, and upon that rock I will build my house, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Wisdom is what builds people. A person that is in this progressive state, being progressively advanced by the word, into the spaces of perfection. You cannot ignore them. But they will leave a landmark. That's why God told David. You will not build me a house. But I will build you a house. By wisdom it is built. By understanding it is established. So when you understand. The deep things of God. You can't be moved. You can't be established. You, you can't be disestablished. You cannot be shaken. Your place is firm. Your space is firm. And the knowledge, the knowledge now that you have is what feels it. Meaning that if all what you have is knowledge, then you will feel everything and never feel a house. <laughs> you will feel everything. That's why you will keep on peddling your information because your and Bible says knowledge puffs up. So you will want everyone to invite you. I remember someone came, came to this church and they had come for a meeting and they told me that they also know how to preach and I should invite them to preach. Why should I invite them to preach? Because they have knowledge. They teach on social media. That's what the pastor told me. I teach on social media. So invite me to come and preach. Why? They have knowledge. And knowledge is puffing up. So they don't understand what we are constructing in this house. <laughs> because kingdom and life embassy is not built because I know how to hold a Bible. It's because there are things I have been perfected in. Uh -uh. So just because your phone has the option of Facebook Live does not mean what you know is necessary to be known. First get a house. Establish it. Then begin to feel it. Get a house. Get a house. Because it is wisdom and wisdom is Christ. Is the revelation of Christ. Until that revelation is rightly handled and rightly flows to you, then you have a house. Until that happens, then you will keep on trying to show us that you can argue with us. Some of us, when we talk to you about some realities, we have been walking with God and you, you have been reading Facebook posts. 
you have combined several Facebook posts to form your knowledge base. And now you want to come and dispense it in my house. I disagree, man of God. I heard somebody saying, when you see a post began with, with all due respect, <laughs> wait to be disrespected. <laughs> with all due respect. Wait to be what? To be disrespected. I'm praying that God is going to grow us in the enterprise of wisdom. Because this is what we were born again for. We were born again to access to access the spaces of salvation and the mystery of salvation. That we will begin to demonstrate this when the Holy Spirit allows me next. I will talk about now this manifold wisdom that we've just talked about. How it is made known by the church to principalities, powers, rulers, and authorities. The Bible says, do not be wise in your own conceit. Do not be wise in your own conceit. It said, says, be ever in the fear of the Lord. I want to pray for you that is not born again because the only wisdom you can ever manifest on the earth is accepting the one whose name is wisdom. And I want you to lead you in that prayer. I want you to pray this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you. I acknowledge that I am a sinner. But you that is wisdom, you died for me that I would not die in my sins. Today I accept your reality. I accept your work. Forgive my sins. Wash me with your blood. And begin to make me into what you want me to be. Satan, I reject you. I reject your works. I reject your covenants. And by the blood of the covenant of Jesus, I receive my salvation from your covenants, from your power. You have nothing in me from this day. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I am now your child in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you for this dear one that has given their lives to you, that has accepted you to be their Lord and their Savior. Lord, may salvation, the salvation that entered the home of Zacchaeus, may that salvation access their life right now in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I pray may salvation have access into their space. Let them, Lord God Almighty, not end up wicked. Let them not end up in shame. In the mighty name of Jesus, I rebuke every demonic quark. Satan, you have got to let them go. Right now, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, your power and your hand in their lives is broken. From this day forward, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, and I decree that they are loose, they are released, to operate in the truth of salvation, to operate in the convictions of salvation, that the name of the Lord will be greatly exalted in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. I want to release the power of this gospel into your life because the gospel of Jesus Christ is power. I'm releasing power upon your life right now by the preaching, by the breath of the Holy Ghost. I'm releasing miracles into your life right now. Wherever you are, if you are sick in any part of your body, lay your hand in that position. We have seen the Lord healing sicknesses of every kind. Whatever sickness you have right now, I am rebuking it in the mighty name of Jesus. There is no condition. Listen to me. As the Lord lives. There is no condition that is going to remain in any body that believes this word. Your body will not carry any disease after this prayer in the mighty name of Jesus. Because it's not just a prayer by a man of God, but this is the power of the gospel accessing your life. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. I thank you for your spirit. And I thank you for the reality of your gospel. And right now I am releasing miracles in the lives of your people. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I command uncommon miracles. In the mighty name of Jesus. Holy Spirit as you sent me to breathe this word. As you sent me to proclaim this word. You are in the places where these people that are hearing me are. Right now I'm speaking. Whoever is a sinner may that become conviction. But I'm praying 
according to every the principality that is in that space. May there now come judgments. I judge sicknesses. I judge diseases. I command them out of the bodies of your people. In the mighty name of Jesus. Yes. Yes. In the name of Jesus. I am seeing them and I'm rebuking them. I am seeing these answers. You answers. I rebuke you. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. There's someone that has been having such, such strong answers that have been there for the last four weeks. Painful answers, but you are healed right now. You are healed right now. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, uh, I decree the power of healing has located you wherever you are right now. Right now, in the mighty name of Jesus, uh, you are healed. You are healed. You are healed by the name of Jesus. Uh, the name of Jesus rebukes sicknesses. Uh, by the power in that name, uh, every disease leaves. In the name of Jesus Christ. I'm seeing someone that has been having a skin condition. And it's been spreading. It's begun on your neck. And it is now beginning to spread to your face. Right now I decree healing upon you. In the mighty name of Jesus. I decree the healing touch of God. Upon your life right now. Right now you are healed. You are healed in the name of Jesus Christ. In the mighty name of Jesus, I release miracles. I release miracles. Yes, there will be testimonies. There will be testimonies. I'm seeing this person whose kidneys are beginning to fail. And you are having a lot of pain on your right side. But that kidney is now healed. I'm seeing it healed right now in the name of Jesus. Because Satan's work is judged in your life. Satan's work is judged in your life. There's someone that has been battling a drug addiction. You are claiming to be saved, but you've been, you've been signing with this drug addiction and you've been doing it in secret. But the Lord right now has liberated you. That demonic control is judged. It is judged right now. It is judged right now. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Salvation enters people's homes. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. You receive healing. You receive deliverance. By the name of Jesus Christ. No demonic power will oppress you from this day. You have entered into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. In the mighty name of Jesus. And Father, even during this season, I'm praying that you make a distinction in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. That God Almighty, even in the finances of your people, you will increase them. In the name of Jesus. I speak uncommon provision. I speak provision from the ravens of heaven. In the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, the news media made a mockery of us. And they say because people have stopped giving tithes and offerings, we have begun looking up. Lord, today we decree, we have been looking up from the very beginning. And may you God Almighty today silence every wicked tongue in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Every this de demonic tongue that has risen up against us, that has risen up against the knowledge of the Lord, we rebuke it today in the mighty name of Jesus. The spirits that are controlling the airwaves, that are determining what people are going to hear, today we rebuke you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I pray God Almighty as you sustained Elisha, may you sustain your elect in the name of Jesus. May God Almighty this season manifest them that fear you and them that do not fear you. I am praying God Almighty them that have been exalted in high places, uh, that have become haughty because of their achievements, uh, may you bring them low uh, in the name of Jesus. Uh, the same God that Hannah prayed to and say that you are the one that picks the poor from the dust uh, and you make them to sit with kings. Uh, I am praying, raise some people that have been despised uh, and give them the spaces of the arrogant. Uh, give them the dominions of the arrogant uh, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Give them the dominions of the arrogant. You're the one that brings some people down and you raise others. May you do that, Lord God Almighty, to the honor and to the praise of your name. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. In case you're giving your offerings, you'll give them to the numbers, number that is on your screen. And I want to pray for every giver. Lord, I was just prayed. I'm releasing uncommon miracles, uncommon financial miracles. Right now to everyone that is standing with your work, that is giving to your work, that is giving as an expression of your worship, of their worship to you. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray God Almighty, may uncommon supply locate them. May every tither have their open doors, have their open windows. In the mighty name of Jesus. And the Bible says that those who are 
honor you, you shall honor. I pray everyone that is honoring you with their fast fruits and with their offerings. Lord God Almighty, may you also honor them before men. In the mighty name of Jesus, you say them that despise you shall be lightly esteemed. I pray everyone that despises you, O oh God Almighty. Lord, may you also lightly esteem them to the honor and to the praise of your name. I speak the blessing over your life. I say, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord afford you his peace in the name of Jesus Christ. As I've decreed that according to the word of the Lord, I've put the name of Jesus over your life and God shall locate you this week and the Lord shall bless you. I speak that this week the reality of salvation shall come to you. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I speak your mind and your heart. They are opened to receive the wisdom that is from above. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, you will receive the wisdom that is first pure, then peaceable. In the name of Jesus, you are exempted from con contradictions, from arguments, from, from strife of the tongue in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And your salvation will be perfected to the honor and to the praise of the name of the Lord. I decree that you are blessed by El Eloi Israel. God, even the Lord God of Israel, from this time henceforth and forevermore. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. The Lord richly bless you. If you've given your life to Christ, kindly inbox us, let us know. Also, there are a lot of healings that have taken place. If you're one of the people that have been healed, kindly inbox us, let us know. Or you can call the numbers that are on the screen. I hope the numbers are on the screen. You can call the numbers on the screen and we will get your testimony. And we'll continue believing the Lord with you. Remember next week from Friday to Sunday, we'll be having the school of worship. Kindly check our page tomorrow. We'll have the full details as to how it's going to run from Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. But on Sunday, the time is definite. It's from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. So the Lord richly bless you. God give you his peace. God show you mercy. And keep on supporting the work of the Lord. In Jesus' mighty name.